Hear the word of the Lord, Psalm 150. Hallelujah. Praise God in His sanctuary. Praise Him in His mighty expanse. Praise Him for His powerful acts. Praise Him for His abundant greatness. Praise Him with trumpet blast. Praise Him with harp and lyre. Praise Him with tambourine and dance. Praise Him with strings and flute. Praise Him with resounding cymbals. Praise Him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that breathes praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Church, stand and worship with us today. Victory in Jesus. This should be very familiar to everybody, so sing big. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how He gave His life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about His groaning, of His precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and He bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is due. Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Isn't that good news? I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing, how he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, Dear Jesus. Come and heal my broken spirit And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever He sought me and He bought me with His redeeming blood He loved me ere I knew Him And all my love is to Him Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Sing, I heard about a mansion. I heard about a mansion. He is built for me in glory. And I heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea. About the angels singing. And the old redemption story And some sweet day I'll sing up there The song of victory Oh, victory in Jesus My Savior forever He sought me and He bought me With His redeeming blood He loved me ere I knew Him And all my love is to Plunge me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and He bought me with His redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew Him, and all my love is to Him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing blood. Isn't that a great way to start the service off today? Amen, amen. Come on up, Pastor Doug. All right, y'all can be seated. You can be seated. Uh, my name is Doug Miles, pastor here at Greer First Baptist Church. And we appreciate you social distancing, but we're back having church again, worshiping the name above every name. We had a really, really good service at 9 o'clock. Wow, we've got a good attendance here at 11. I know that many of you are watching at home, and we appreciate you worshiping the Lord with us. So again, now, some of you are new, whether you're watching online or you're new, or you're in this service and you're new. 
Well, we're not passing out things right now because of the social distancing, but you can email us. For instance, first name, last name, any staff member at our church. For me, Doug Mize at Greer First ba- or GreerFBC.org. Kim Keller, who takes all our connections card. Kim Keller at GreerFBC.org. And so you can do that right now. We're at home. You can just email us and say, hey, here I am, and you can email us, okay? And that'll be a great way to connect but it's graduation Sunday we have a lot of graduates in our church now quite honestly because of the coronavirus we do not right now we don't have all of our graduates some families quite not not quite ready you might see them in a few weeks depending on the comfortability level but we do have some graduates we're going to honor okay and so for the Mize family we're pretty excited about one of them but Micah you come up and you take our time, and uh, Mike is our student minister here, and we're grateful that you're going to be leading us, okay? Well, it is just an honor to be able to acknowledge and recognize our 2020 graduates this Sunday. Uh, you all know what they've had to endure this season of COVID-19 uh, and how that changed uh, such a special year and so many different memories. And so uh, 2020 graduates, you guys have had to endure so much. And I just want you to know, um, as your student minister, Man, it's just, it's encouraging my heart to see how you guys have persevered through this season. And so, um, well, how about this? You guys, why don't y'all go ahead and come down forward. Uh, I have gift bags for you in this seat. You can grab those, and y'all can stand kind of socially distanced, kind of along the front of the stage here. And uh, we have about seven or eight graduates uh, this year for uh, Career First Baptist Church. Uh, but we do have three of them here today, and I have told them that um, if they want to, yeah, you can stand right there, Mary Catherine. If they want to be acknowledged publicly, we will absolutely do that. As a staff, we want to make that commitment. Well, here are some today. Starting on my left, your right, we have Grace Brackett. She graduated from Wade Hampton High School, and uh, she is headed to Clemson University where she is going to study economics and political science. And so uh, that's a mouthful, and so good luck to you and blessings. Yes, please give her a round of applause. And so uh, next we have here down... In the middle, Mary Catherine Mize, she graduated from Eastside High School, and she is headed also to Clemson University, where she will be studying communications. You can give her a round of applause as well. So, uh, one thing that I'm doing, I've, I've told all of our seniors, I will take them out to lunch at any point during the summer, whenever we can find some time, I was able to enjoy lunch with uh, Grace and Mary Catherine the other day. It was a sweet time together and got to learn about their future plans and whatnot. And just two incredible young ladies. And so, uh, and then here on the um, my right, uh, Riley Smith, he graduated uh, from the Fine Arts Center and he also graduated from Eastside High School. And he is going to be headed to the University of South Carolina to study uh, media arts and computer science. So you can all join in giving him a round of applause as well. And so, Well, seniors, at this time, I want to say a special prayer for you, and then after that, you can go and be seated. Church family, would you join me in praying for our seniors? Father, we come to you in the wonderful name of Jesus, and Lord, it is an incredible blessing to be able to look at these seniors, Lord, that you have uh, built up over their lifetime. And Lord, we didn't know that they would have to endure the weird senior year that they've had to uh, go through, Lord, but I, I, I know that you have been with them during this time. And Lord, it's my prayer that they would continue to grow in Christ's likeness. Uh, They've already had to go through so much in their young lives. And uh, Lord, it's just exciting to know that they're passionate about their futures, each of them. I've talked with them personally, and I know that they are excited about the next chapter in their lives. And so, Lord, as a church, in a way, we almost want to commission them out to be disciple makers of you, King Jesus, as they enter uh, colleges and their future plans. Lord, that you would bless their future plans and that they would submit those to you for your kingdom's cause. And Lord, I do pray that you would uh, bless their families. And Lord, uh, during this summer, Lord, I pray it's the funnest summer that they're able to have. And I pray for their freshman years, Lord, that they would be sweet seasons of life for them where they get to grow uh, in their relationship with you and just get to enjoy your good world to be in. Lord, we pray this in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. You guys can be seated. Church, stand up as we continue to worship. This next song is called Graves in the Gardens. It's a great word about how God can make a difficult situation a wonderful one. 
I search the world But it couldn't fail me And man's empty praise And treasures that fade Are never enough Then you came along And put me back together And every desire is now satisfied Here in your love Oh, there's nothing that's better than you Oh, there's nothing better than you Oh, there's nothing, nothing is better than you The next part says, I'm not afraid And I'm not afraid show you my weakness my failures and flaws lord you've seen them all and you still call me friend because the god of the mountain is the god of the valley and there's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, oh there's nothing that's better than you. Oh, there's nothing that's better than you. Oh, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Sing that again. Oh, there's nothing that's better than you. Oh, there's nothing that's better than you. Oh, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. This next part says, you turn my morning into dancing. Turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only Sing it loud this morning. Oh, there's nothing that's better than you. Oh, there's nothing that's better than you. Oh, there's nothing. Nothing is better than you. You turn graves into God. turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. 
and turn it into something. God, we learn in Ezekiel that you can take dry bones and say, bones, stand up. And they will live because you told them to. Lord, we learned from Moses, Lord, in Exodus that you can take a sea and you can divide it and you can turn it into a highway. And Lord, when things seem hopeless, you give hope. So God, we lift that, that praise to you, God, for being a bridge builder, for being a way maker. We lift you, lift you up and glorify you and praise your name. God, thank you for dwelling with us today. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. Church, you may be seated. one of the most incredible ways one way we get to worship the Lord is through our gifts of tithes and offerings and I want to take just a moment as pastor to thank you who could have imagined three and a half months ago right that we'll be in this place and not be able to meet for three months and we're grateful that we're meeting again although a little bit different spread out but in the midst of that I want to thank you church and those at home that Although down a little bit, you've been very faithful in your giving. And I want to say thank you. And so we know that's an act of worship. We worship the Lord in the way we trust him and our gifts and tithes and with our finances. Also, you should absolutely, church, be very proud of your staff. Three months ago, staff took a 10% pay cut just to try to work together as a team. And that's what we are. We're, we're a team. We're a church. We're God's family together and so we're working together so I'm so proud of our staff and I know you are as well but this is a privilege to give and absolutely many of you have learned to give online through the website and through the realm app on your phone you've mailed in your gifts to us Dropbox in my office I can hear the Dropbox and I always say praise the Lord anytime I hear the Dropbox okay I mean you might be putting a pile of dirt in there I don't know but I say praise the Lord I mean that's what I do goes in the safe and I just say praise the Lord and then we have a way to give no we don't get to pass the plates right now but the giving box is on the way out and you're, you're putting your gifts there thank you but we give the Lord the credit because every gift we have is from him anyway everything's his so join me as we pray please father we worship you and we worship you in the way we give our tithes and offerings. And Lord, you're worthy. You're worthy of that and so much more. But it is an act of worship. So even now, people at home or people in here as they walk out are going to give. And I pray that you'd bless them. Lord, you're the one who tells us that you're going to meet all of our needs according to your riches and glory. And you've proven that through your church here at Greer First Baptist Church. And we praise you for that. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen.
in the first service, we had a few more of our younger families and some children with us. And we do, we do in this service as well, and probably some at home. And I always, uh, I want to remind the children, they're very important to this church. They're very important to this pastor. And I want to teach in a way that every one of our children, no matter their age, will get something out of the sermon. Well, today I don't have any real excuse, not that I ever do, but I'm preaching one of the most famous scriptures in all the Bible. One of the greatest stories in the Bible, Daniel and the lion's den. So I'm pretty excited. We've been making our way the last seven weeks through the book of Daniel. And so we have kind of been making our way through this incredible book. And now, right in the middle of the book, is absolutely the most famous story in the book of Daniel. And I was telling some kids earlier, you know, I think it's a top three story. Like, if you were playing Family Feud, most popular story in the Bible, I mean, believe me, Daniel and the lion's den's right up there. Yeah, you've got Goliath and David, and you, sure, you've got Jonah and the big fish, but hello, Daniel in the den of lions? I mean, that's a big one, right? And so I hope not to mess it up. I don't want to do that, okay? And one way, I'm going to make sure that we don't mess it up, and this is a key. And this isn't just for this sermon. This isn't just for any day. It's for every day. Always look for God in the story, absolutely. Sure, we can brag on Daniel. We can talk about how mean and fierce those lions were. But let's be clear, this is a story about God this is a big story about God and I think it'll change the way that you see this incredible incredible story of Daniel in the lion's den well Daniel the book of Daniel is broken up into two parts the first six chapters the first half of the book of Daniel it's all historical I mean what happened and how exciting and wow it's a neat and just looking at the life of Daniel and his three other friends I mean it's real exciting now the last six chapters of the book of Daniel is very prophetic okay and so it's still very interesting but it's interesting in a different way so the last half of the book of Daniel we're going to look at some prophecies and what exactly is Daniel trying to get us to see in the last six chapters but we're right in the middle today but this is neat when you start thinking about Daniel and yeah he's one of the most famous guys in the Old Testament absolutely but we already know Daniel has incredible character. For instance, we can find something kind of negative to say about Moses. Well, he got angry. We can say something negative about Abraham because he lied about who his wife really was. We can find a lot of things to say about King David because he committed adultery and even murder. But you can't find anything bad about Daniel. Oh, now he wasn't perfect, I'm sure. But you can't find anything in the scripture that says anything negative about Daniel. And that's within the first five chapters. We don't need to see Daniel in the lion's den to know he's, got a, he's a man of character. We don't need Daniel chapter 6 in the lion's den to tell us he was a man of faith. We know that because of the first five chapters. We already know Daniel has great courage. I mean, it doesn't matter which king it is. It doesn't matter what happens. He doesn't need the presence. He doesn't need the promotion. He is going to do what God has called him to do. We don't need Daniel chapter 6 to tell us this. And he loved God. We love God. He loved God. We don't need Daniel chapter 6 to tell us that. So again, this really isn't that much about Daniel. I know that's crazy to think about. We already know what kind of man Daniel is. Now, he's 85 years old at this point. A lot of people forget that. I mean, he spent almost 70 years in captivity in Babylon. Ripped from his mother's arms, taken to a faraway land. And so, for the mo almost all his life, he's been in uh, the control of Babylon. But there's a new king in town, okay? The Medes and Persians have come. And yeah, they might be still using the same palace, but Babylon's gone. The Medes and Persians are here, and they mean business. It doesn't matter to Daniel. He's still going to keep doing what he's done the other 69 years. So, there's a new king. In Daniel chapter 6, it talks about this man by the name of Darius. Now, a lot of people think that's really King Cyrus. At the last verse of chapter 6, it, talk, it says something about King Darius and King Cyrus. But a lot of commentators tell you they're the same person. 
Well, let me tell you, I've studied that thing all week, and I still don't know, okay? But either way, it works. The new king's in town. He's in control, but God is going to use this new kingdom and this new king in a, an incredible way. And I believe chapter 6 is the pivot point of all that. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and tell you the main idea. The main idea of Daniel chapter 6 is this. Very important. God is working. God is working in communion with his people to deliver them for the praise he is due. God is working in communion with his people to deliver them for the praise he is due. And I like the first three words of that. God is working. Can I have an amen that God is working? Are you glad God is working. When you turn on the news or you look on your iPhone and you figure out what's going on in the world, it's a good reminder today that God is working. And I want to assure you, He is. Listen, Daniel knows that quite well. I mean, again, all the suffering Daniel's gone through, all the ups and downs. This king comes, another king, he gets demoted, he gets promoted, he gets threatened, all these things. One thing's for sure, Daniel knows God is working. Now he's 85 years old. He doesn't have much time left. I will tell you that Daniel probably does not make it back to Jerusalem. Although in the very year after this, King Cyrus, because of some incredible things God is doing, he allows God's people to return to Jerusalem. It's an incredible story. Wow. But God is working. So again, new kingdom. Whether it's Cyrus or that's really Darius, same thing. You know, Daniel's very name means God is my judge. And he's lived that way for 85 years. God's my judge. I'm going to honor you, Nebuchadnezzar. And I'm going to honor you, Darius. But let's be clear, God is my judge. So this new kingdom comes, new king. And again, Daniel is put in charge of everything. I mean, that's the kind of character he has. That's the kind of leader he is. And this new king understands that this guy, he's really special. The Bible says in the first nine verses that Daniel has an extraordinary spirit. So he puts him in charge of almost his entire kingdom. But the problem is, and it's really not a problem because God is working, is that some people get je jealous of Daniel. So the administrators get together and they start talking and then they start plotting. We don't want Daniel in charge of us. we got to come up with a plan. But the Bible says in the first nine chapters, they could not figure out any way to accuse Daniel of anything. But they did know something about Daniel. That he loved God more than anything. So they devised a plot. They devised a plan. And they went to King Darius and said, listen, let's make a law. And you sign the law. Use your signet ring. And the law was this, that just for 30 days, one month, 30 days, no one can pray to any other God except you. Okay? Well, he was foolish. And he agreed to make that law that the entire kingdom, for 30 days, they could only pray to him. Bad law. Bad law. But Daniel knows that. And Daniel's aware of the repercussions because the law states that if anybody does defy the king's order, they will be thrown into a den full of lions. No good. Well, Daniel, his name means God is my judge. He understands the consequences. He understands what could happen. But remember the thing, God is working. And this is a tough thing. You say, why does God allow this? He should have killed all those administrators on the spot or he should he should have made the king's heart not go along with this bad law but listen sure it looks bad for the home team but God is working and maybe that's a good reminder for you today that God is working three and a half four months into COVID-19 can I remind you that God is working you turn on the news and you see all the racial tension all the hurt that's out in our country right now I want to tell you that God is working. And God is up to something. He's up to something. And I need to be reminded of that every day. I need to be reminded of that. I told you last week, 
Got to spend some incredible times with local pastors, many of them African Americans. What are we doing? We're sharing. What are we doing? We're praying. What are we doing? We're, we're talking. Absolutely. I tell my pastor friends, you know, it's kind of hard to listen when you're talking all the time. It's, it's good to listen and it's good to talk. But one thing that everybody says, it, one thing we agree on, a lot of people hurting. Our country is hurting. Absolutely. But is God working? Oh, yes, he's working. What's our response? To listen. You know, we got one mouth and two ears, okay? So we, we listen. Absolutely. And we mourn with those that are mourning, and we hurt with those that are hurting. It can be our African-American friends. It can be a, 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 a police officer um, that lost his life. And we've seen both of that. We've seen terrible things on all ends. But God is at work. You know, it's neat for me to get, I've got a, a specific friend I'm trying to get up with this week, pastor friend, African-American and it just encourages me to hear his heart and his perspective. I encourage you to do that. But here's the thing. When you talk to your friends around the water cooler, or you're in your cul-de-sac and you're talking to friends, can I just say this? Point people to Jesus Christ. Point people to the only one that can totally reconcile any of us. Jesus Christ is his name. And at Greer First Baptist Church, we are resolute that above anything else we might say that might be good, the greatest thing we can ever say is put your hope and your trust in Jesus Christ. That was what Daniel was known for. Old kings came and politicians came and they had this and they had that. But everybody knew that Daniel loved only one thing supremely. And that was his heavenly father. God is working. Just remember my friends, God is at work. Next thing about this main point, it's all about the main point. God is working. Here it is, number two. God is working, but number two, God is in communion with his people. God is in communion with his people. Let's get back to the scripture. What's, what's Daniel going to do? I mean, the law's been made. It cannot be reversed. What, what's going to happen here? I mean, it looks bad for Daniel. Well, verse 10 tells us, look in the scripture. That when Daniel learned that the document had been signed, he went to his house. And the windows in its upstairs room opened towards Jerusalem. And three times a day he got down on his knees, prayed, and gave thanks to God just as he had done before. What's Daniel going to do? It's a bad law. You know what Daniel's going to do? What he always does. Daniel's going to do what he always does. He's going to meet with God. Now you might see the scripture in verse 10, and verse 10 is the key. And you might say, wow, that's amazing. I mean, Daniel knew the document had been signed and he still went. Yeah, absolutely. He was, a, he was fully aware and fully aware of the consequences, okay? And then you say, wow, bold. I mean, his windows, and he had a nice place. I mean, you know, he was one of the leaders of the kingdom. I mean, he had a nice place. And his windows opened into Jerusalem. He's courageous. Yeah, he's courageous. But he was longing for something as well. Think about this. Now, Daniel hadn't been to Jerusalem in over 70 or almost 70 years. Had not been to Jerusalem. He was ripped from his mother's arms probably at the age of 13, 14, 15. And so when he prayed, he wanted to open his windows towards Jerusalem. Think about the longing. Think about thinking about his mother and father that are certainly long gone by now. Hmm. Praying to his heavenly father. Looking towards Jerusalem. Now this is a beautiful picture. Again, I don't think Daniel makes it back. But let's be clear. God is orchestrating this incredible story. And we're going to see it come out. Why? Because God's going to do something in the king's heart that says, You know what? This kind of God, this great of a God, we need to let his people go home. Something's going to happen through these events in chapter 6. God's going to work in a pagan king heart through Daniel and through his life that although Daniel never makes it home with his windows towards Jerusalem, that God allows his people to go home. Isn't that good? Isn't that cool? So Daniel, all this, sure he's courageous, sure he's got a lot of character, all that, but, but you know why he prayed? Because he had to meet with God. 
That's why. Why did he open his windows? Because he had to meet with God. Every day he had to pray. And every day he had to be with God. Can I encourage you today? Get with God. I mean, always get with God. But especially in these difficult days, get with God. No matter what you're going through, no matter at home, whatever you're going through, get in a place that you can pray and commune with God. Look at Daniel. He, had to, he wasn't trying to make a joke. He wasn't trying to, well, I'm going to show him. I don't have to do what the king says. I'm going to do my own thing. That's not what Daniel, he's just doing what he always does. He must meet with God. And so do you and I. We must meet with God. We need to look. To the King of Kings and Lord of Lords every day, especially now. Commune with God. All right, main point. I'm highlighting this main point. Here's, here's number three. Verses 14 through 24, we'll see it. That God is delivering his people. Good news, right? God is delivering his people. This is the fun part, okay? This is the story that we all remember and we get into. Let me read verses 14 through 24. It says that as soon as the king heard, now what did he hear? He heard that Daniel was praying. And he knew, he loved Daniel, but he knew he couldn't go back. He's going to try something, but look. Verse 14, as soon as the king heard this, he was very displeased. He set his mind on rescuing Daniel and made every effort until sundown to deliver him. Then these men went together to the king and said to him, you know, your majesty, this is the law of the Medes and Persians, that no edict or ordinance that the king establishes can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, may your God, whom you continually serve, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signet ring of his nobles so that nothing in regard to Daniel could be changed. Then the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting and no diversions were brought to him and he could not sleep, couldn't sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den and he reached the den. He cried out in anguish to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, the king said, has your God whom you continually serve been able to rescue you from the lions? Then Daniel spoke with the king, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth and they haven't harmed me for I was found innocent before him and also before you, your majesty, I have not done harm. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to take Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was brought up from the den, he was found to be unharmed, for he trusted in his God. And the king then gave the command, and those who had maliciously accused Daniel were brought and thrown into the lion's den. They, their children, and their wives, they had not reached the bottom of the den before the lions overpowered them and crushed all their bones. Wow. That's the story we remember without edit. I mean, there are some details you might have forgotten about that story. It's an incredible story of deliverance for Daniel. Wow. But that's, an, that's the business of God. I mean, that's, that's what he enjoys doing. He loves to deliver people. So we see this. And Darius liked Daniel. And he wanted to figure out a way to go back on his word. But he couldn't. He couldn't. And they had it. He had been fooled by these administrators and he had to throw Daniel in the lion's den. But there is a hint of faith already. And I like this about Darius. But when he threw Daniel in the lion's den, it says, May your God, whom you continually serve, deliver you. And then he couldn't sleep all night. Couldn't sleep all night. But at the very first beam of sunlight hit that temple early that morning, he ran to the lion's den. And he yelled out to Daniel. And you're not supposed to talk to people that are dead. Amen. He yells out to Daniel. Daniel. Has your God whom you continually serve been able to rescue you from the line? And Daniel says. You know that's right. I mean that's what Daniel says. Essentially. You know that's right king. 
I haven't defiled my, defiled my God, and I haven't done anything wrong to you. May you live forever. Oh, wow. You think the king ever forgot this? <laughs> An 85-year-old man, this strong, this courageous, and that God had delivered him in such a powerful way. What does Daniel say? Daniel said, well, those lines, they knew better to mess with me. You know, they knew I could handle my business. No. Daniel gives credit where credit's due. God sent his angel to shut the mouths of the lion. God did this. God sent his angel. Now, who's the angel? Well, let me give you the short answer. I'm not sure, okay? I'm not exactly sure, but I know this. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego before another king was threatened, and they were put into the fiery furnace, King Nebuchadnezzar looks down and says, Wait a minute, I thought there was three, but I see four. And the fourth one's walking around like he's the son of God. And I believe he was the son of God. I believe that was a pre-incarnate um, Jesus Christ himself in the flesh with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do I think this is Jesus in the lion's den with Daniel? I don't know, but I'm going to tell you, this preacher likes to think it was Jesus. Daniel says, an angel. I'm not sure what they talked about that night. I have no clue. Maybe they didn't say a word to one another. But the angel or Jesus Christ, whoever he was, closed the mouths of those lines and protected Daniel. <laughs> oh, don't you love the story? But there's something greater than this. I mean, you know, Daniel is spared. And we tell our kids and all the Bible stories. And that's how God worked in Daniel's life. That's right. But, you know. God's more interested in saving just Daniel because within one year, you can read about this in Ezra. It's also written about in Chronicles. King Cyrus, he's got a new law, and this law has nothing about bow down and pray to me. There's no gold statue this time you got to bow down. It's a new law. It can't be changed. And he says, there's a new God in town, and God wants his people back. And I'm going to let them go. I'm going to let them go. Let God's people return to their homeland. And we'll send them money. And one day they're going to rebuild the temple. Because I found out who the real God is. Do you not think he's talking about Daniel 6? You know the king knows what he's talking about. Because he saw God work. In this miraculous way, delivering Daniel. Yeah, God wanted to deliver Daniel. But you know what? He's 85 years old. I mean, if he didn't make it, it's okay. I mean, I'm just being real with you today. But more importantly, God was going to deliver Daniel so that all of God's people could have deliverance. <laughs> and there's someone greater than Daniel we point to. You know, Daniel, he was a son of David. Okay? Okay. Now, of course, Daniel never had any children. He was in captivity. No children. But he was still a son of David. But the Bible says, and even Daniel knew, that out of the line of David would come a ruler. Not just any ruler. The ruler. And his kingdom would last forevermore. And in the last chapter, chapters of the book of Daniel, we're going to look at that prophecy. Absolutely we will. And so another one from the line of David. But this one greater than Daniel. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. And one day this same ruler, Jesus Christ, he would go to the cross so he could redeem all of mankind. You know, Daniel was rescued from the mouths of the lion. But when Jesus Christ went to Golgotha's hill, there was no substitute. When Abraham had grabbed the knife to sacrifice his son Isaac, God intervened and sent the ram who was slain instead of his son. But near that same place, at Golgotha's Hill, there was no substitute for Jesus Christ. He must endure the penalty for all of our sin. But when Jesus Christ bowed his head and he says, It is finished. He redeemed all of mankind. All of us who call upon his name. There's someone greater than Daniel. Look, 
yeah, I like this story. I like Jonah and the big fish. I like David and Goliath. Those are great stories. But kids, teenagers, those at home, the greatest story ever, let it be known, is Jesus Christ dying on the cross for our sins. Three days later, gloriously resurrected, proving that he is God. He is able to take away the sin of all of us. That's who we look to. We look to the cross. Well, there's one final point, and it's a good point. The last point, verses 25 through 28, you'll see this, that God is receiving the praise he is due. Why is God doing all this? Hey, so we can worship him, that he can receive the praise he is due. Verses 25 through 28. Then King Darius wrote to those of every people, nation, and language who live on the whole earth. May your prosperity abound. I issue a decree that in all my royal dominion, people must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and he endures forever. His kingdom will never be destroyed and his dominion has no end. He rescues, I guess he does. He rescues and delivers. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. For he has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. And again, they could be the same people. We don't know. The end of chapter 6, well, it's much like the way chapters 2, 3, and 4 ended. Chapters 2, 3, 4, and 6 in the book of Daniel, four out of the first six chapters, end with some pagan king, some evil, evil king, having to praise the name above every name. I, I like that. I mean, all four of those six chapters, they end the same way. A new song is written by an evil king to say, I have found out who the true God is. And I know his name. And I'm going to write a song. I'm going to write a letter so that every tribe and tongue and nation know who the real king is. Now, I like that a whole lot. I like that a whole lot. Because God will receive his praise. That's the thing. God's working in difficult times. We're struggling. You know, I'm, I'm one of the dads. I had a senior. And, and, you know, a lot of ups and downs, a lot of downs the last few months. And I know many of you have had your ups and downs at work, at home challenges, financial, whatever it is. But God's going to receive the praise. God is at work and we can trust him. And he's pointing the world to himself. And that's what I... Water cooler, neighborhoods, friends, family, tell them, yeah, it's tough. We need to listen. We need to speak less and listen more. Absolutely. And there's no easy answers. I'm in for the long game on this. It's the long game, trying to figure out, both with the virus and the racial tensions, long game, how we can love more and listen better. But let's be clear. God's working in all these difficult circumstances to point people to himself. Not our finances, not our sports watching, not our education, not any of those things. That we get our support and strength through Jesus Christ because he is good. My friends, he is good. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you that we can gather in this place once again and worship you. Your due, your praise, and you will have it. But Lord, we pray that you would soften our hearts so that we might be conformed to your image. I know I have a lot to learn. We all have a lot to learn through you and your word. But we see from your word that there is hope, and there's hope in you, and we must commune with you and we must understand you're the deliverer and we must give the praise that you are due take this time of invitation soften our hearts change us save someone today for your glory it's in jesus name we pray amen i'm gonna ask you to stand we're gonna have to do invitation these next few weeks a little bit different in just a moment micah's gonna walk to the back door over here and during the song of invitation while we stand together go ahead and stand together if you have a decision for King Jesus during this last song, you can go in the back. And I know uh, that uh, Micah and other staff people would love to minister to you. You might be ready to give Jesus Christ your life. If that's your decision, 
You can speak to Micah. But during the song and invitation, you praise the name above every name. Allow God to speak to you. Let's sing. Let's respond.
feel good to worship the name above every name again to gather in this place? Let's give the Lord a hand. God is good. Amen. The Lord is good. All right. So, got a little news we want to share with you. And let me go ahead and warn you a little bit. Bittersweet. There's some sweet. There is a little, little, little hard to. But I'm not going to steal the thunder of Josh and Hannah. I'm going to let them share. And after they share, we're, I'll pray for them. But uh, you know what I think of these wonderful, wonderful people. But let them share from their hearts. So, Josh, go ahead. Well, for several weeks now, Hannah and I have been uh, praying and wrestling with the Lord and what his path is for us. Um, uh, and we wanted to announce to you guys that uh, in about five weeks, five weeks from today, um, will be our last Sunday here at Greer First Baptist. We um, are going to uh, a church up in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, the church is called Spotswood Baptist Church, uh, where I will be the worship pastor there. Um, and this is something, um, like I said, we've been wrestling with. Uh, we both grew up here in the upstate of South Carolina. We love the upstate of South Carolina. We love Greer First Baptist Church. And um, we wanted to make sure that we were doing and following God's will. And after praying um, over this for several weeks, we believe that it is God's will for us to continue our ministry together up in Fredericksburg, Virginia. Um, I know a lot of people have questions and uh Probably the number one question is, can we keep Hannah? Um, but she's coming with me. But uh, th I, I want to say uh, from the both of us, uh, we love you and thank you for the, the wonderful time that we've been able to spend with you here. Um, and we look forward to see how God continues to work through Greer First Baptist Church and how God continues to use us up in Fredericksburg, Virginia. So. I'm going to pray for these guys. Let me just say, uh, Josh and Hannah, of course, I married these wonderful people a couple years ago, but um, <clears throat> three and a half years ago, Josh came on staff. I'd only been here six months, and just to see how God has grown him, uh, helped see God do incredible things in this church, and now God is preparing him, and he's so humble. Let me just say, the opportunity in Washington, D.C. is incredible. Um, I talked to the pastor, wonderful man. I saw the church. I tried to come up with a reason he shouldn't go, and but only the Lord could open up this incredible opportunity for them. Um, so we need to be very excited for them, but it's okay to mourn too. Believe me, I talked about mourning with those that mourn. This pastor's been mourning all week, I can promise you, but I'm excited because when you build a team, and our church has built this incredible team, you know, God might have bigger plans eventually for them. So we're excited for you. And this is not goodbye. We've got four or five weeks, and we haven't figured it out yet, but we'll have to socially distance love them somehow. They're going to be with us for a month or so. So we got time to talk and celebrate what God is doing. But right now, we love you. I know I speak on behalf of the church. We love you both. God's got his hand upon you both. He's got big plans, and you know you're always welcome back here to visit with us because we know you got family here, so we'll know you'll be back. All right, but let's uh, stand together, and we're going to dismiss in prayer. Lord, you're good, and you know in your sovereign plan we can trust you. And we know that even in the midst of these days, we have learned to trust you even more. For us at Greer First Baptist Church for three and a half years or so, we have loved these two, and we've seen how you've brought them together and then used them both in the ministry of this church and growing our worship ministry to what it is. And Lord, we know that you are not done with them. You have big plans and incredible things you're going to do through them near D.C. And Lord, we know you've got great plans for us at Greer First Baptist Church. Help us to walk in the steps you want us to walk. Bring the people alongside that you want to bring. We're incumbent in trusting you for these things. And Jesus, we're going to exalt you. We're going to lift your name up in worship and in, in preaching and everything we do in this church for your glory alone because you're the one who would do it. And we love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen, amen. If you're in the back four rows, you can be dismissed first. Those in the middle and the front, just wait just a second and you, you can be dismissed. God bless you.